My name is Jennifer, and today I'm bringing you some closure dispatches from a national research lab. The goal of this talk is that by the end of this, you will understand how mountains and a pile of dice are all related to closure, and there might be a couple other takeaways as well. So before we get started, I wanted to give an overview of what kind of talk this is. This is an experience report. I'm going to kind of outline a problem that we had to, to solve and how we use closure and a variety of different closure libraries to solve that problem. Um, and the reason that I have dispatches in the title is because I liked this definition of dispatch as an official communication sent by a special messenger. So that lets me call myself a special messenger or perhaps even a dispatcher, which then I get to use this awesome card from the Pandemic Legacy board game, of which I'm a huge fan. So it was a win all around. So this is an overview of how this talk is broken down. I'm going to give some background about where I work, what, what my background is, and the problem that we were trying to solve. And then I'll go through the approach that we took to solve that problem. And then I'll summarize with some opinions about how well that approach did or didn't work. Uh, there will be a liberal sprinkling of opinions throughout the approach section as well. All right, let's start with those mountains. So I work out at Sandia National Laboratories. We're one of many uh, national labs around the United States. And one of our goals is to work with government agencies to solve problems that are facing our nation as a whole. Uh, so Sandia itself has been around since the late 1940s. So it's been around a pretty long time. We have over 10,000 employees last time I checked. I do not work with all 10,000 of these people, but it's a big place. We're doing a lot of different kinds of uh, research and different kinds of projects. So the name Sandia is from the mountains that are in Albuquerque. Sandia is in Albuquerque, the main campus, but there's some other campuses around the United States as well. Uh, but the reason that it's named Sandia is for these mountains. And if there are Spanish speakers in the audience, you'll know that Sandia is the Spanish word for fruit. And so, uh, not for fruit, for watermelon. So we are not named after a fruit, we're named after these watermelon mountains because that's the color they get when the sun sets on them. Okay, so a little bit about my background. I started working at Sandia in 1999. And if you do the math, that equals a very, very long time. Um, but in that time, I was starting to think about the different technologies that I've used and the languages I've gone through. But when, it, when I stepped back and thought about it, I've really spent all that time just working with data and the systems there that have to deal with using data, storing it, getting it back out. And that's not all that interesting of a problem. I think we all do that in some capacity. But what I really enjoyed is getting to talk to users about that data. One of the cool things about working at Sandia is that we have a lot of subject matter experts that are kind of at the top of their field, and they're doing really interesting work. And being able to talk to them about the data and how they want to use it has been a really a cool experience. So as I mentioned, we've been around for a really long time. We don't adopt new technology super fast sometimes. So how do you get closure into a national lab? You bring in a Mark Bastion. He's the one who's responsible for kind of getting closure going in our, uh, in our area. And this is a picture of him giving a talk at the Closure Conj in 2015. And one of the really cool things about working at Sandia is that I can work on a whole bunch of different projects. In my time there, I've worked with different groups of people, different kinds of data, different kinds of applications. And so a couple of years ago, I started working with Mark on a project that was written in both Clojure and Scala. And I had the great fortune of getting to work on the Clojure side of things. So I did what you do with any new project. I started looking through the code, trying to understand it, fixing some bugs, adding some new features. And I have to say that the first time that I looked through something in some code and realized that that data was in a map and that that's how that data was represented, I didn't have a class hierarchy, I didn't have this really strong typing, I was immediately hooked. I was like, this is what I want to do. And since then, I've never gone back. I have the great fortune of getting to pick some of the languages that we use on our projects. And Clojure is my first choice for most of what we're trying to do. Um, this is my About Me slide. In case you can't tell, I like a lot of different things. I don't have a lot of focus. Um, it's a little bit of a self-serving side to say, hey, I like all these things. But if you look down the right-hand side, you'll see an awful lot of tabletop role-playing and board gaming references. And this is kind of fair warning that those are going to keep showing up. And that kind of fantasy thing will show up to the rest of this talk. So be warned and prepared. OK, so that's the background about me and about where I work. Let's start talking about the problem that we're trying to solve. This is a snapshot from the Sandia.gov website. 
I don't know if this person on this site realizes that he's on a big screen right now, but I wanted to uh, kind of hone in on the research section of this website. So those are down the left, but they're kind of hard to see, so I've pulled them out here. And if you look at the different research areas and the different kinds of problems that we're trying to solve out at Sandia, there's a pretty broad range of data represented there. Um, so traditionally in the past, what we've kind of seen happen is that we had researchers working in a given field and they needed data and they couldn't really get it. So a lot of our jobs as software folks were to try to help them get data in so that they could work on solving problems with that. Well, now we kind of have data coming out of our ears. So our problem has, started, has shifted. We have to be able to figure out how to help them deal with all of that data. The other thing that we've seen recently is that while traditionally you would have a subject matter expert, they're kind of working on their silo of data, they're like, I have all my data in here and I'm gonna work on this problem using this kind of data and everything is good. Well, recently what we've started to see more and more is that these um, researchers are looking up and saying, hey, I've got my data, you've got your data, your data looks really cool. Well, what can I do if I take my data and your data and I start bringing them together? we're finding that there's this whole new class of problems that we can solve when we start enabling them to do that. So this sounds like a really good idea, right? But what happens when this starts to happen in practice? So we have, the case that I've seen is somebody will say, oh, I'd really like some of your data. And they're like, great, here you go. And they're like, I don't know what this is. I don't know how to use this. And they're like, oh, it's okay. Here, let me find this parser that I wrote and I'll give it to you. And you're like, well, how do I run it? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> so it kind of, there's kind of some issues around that. And so then inevitably we have someone step up and say, you know what we need? We need a universal schema that will define all data for all time and we'll never have this problem again. Yeah, that's not how that goes. We end up with another standard that we have to support on top of all these other standards that have been around for a long time. I've worked with data with like, uh, that had formats defined in like the late 60s, things that have been defined since the 90s, and so we have to support both those and everything moving forward. So this is kind of a problematic approach. Here are some of the other challenges that we see. Uh, a lot of times for the same kind of data, it's coming in from different places. So we don't have a lot of control about where that data is generated and how it's coming into, into Sandia. And so even data that theoretically represents the same thing it looks different. So we end up building like all these streams coming in and all these little custom parsers on the front of them. And that doesn't scale up very well at all. A lot of times we're messing with kind of emerging data sets and they have these proprietary formats. So again, we, it doesn't scale as we keep trying to deal with all of these things coming in. We get lots of versioning issues. We get a lot of duplication because we have individual researchers pulling in that data on their own, kind of putting it in their home directory, and someone else is doing the same thing. So if they try to share or collaborate, it gets tricky. My absolute favorite is when I'm talking to a scientist about this really awesome data set they have. I'm like, great, we would like to bring that into our system. How do we get at that? And they say, oh, let me go turn on the power on that server under my desk. Okay. Can I get to that? Well, I don't know, we'll try. Okay, I can see it, but I can't log in. And then I get there and I don't understand it. And so this, is, this has been a problem repeatedly. The thing that I have across the bottom represents some of the other issues that we see. Everybody has their own tools, a lot of times in their home directories, a lot of times written in languages that aren't supported that we can't get to run on something else. So we have a lot of issues around just getting the data and understanding it and being able to bring it into our system. Now that I've kind of outlined the problem, I'm gonna go into our approach to solving this problem. Uh, we have kind of a unique system in that we aren't building a system that we need to uh, support 24 seven necessarily. We're not trying to turn a profit on this system. And we also need to be able to let the researchers and the people who are close to the data know, to, know that data hook into the system as well. So we have kind of this weird, like we can't wall off what we're working on from the people that are using it. They can actually get in there a lot. So this pre presents some challenges as you might imagine. So I'm gonna go through a couple of aspects of the system that I wanna talk about, I've highlighted here. This is just kind of a data flow diagram. I'm real big into pictures and here are where the dice start to show up. We, um, we chose to use 
Docker containers for reasons that are kind of outside of the scope of this uh, talk that has to do with kind of the systems that we're running on. But what I wanted to talk about a little, since we're at a closure conference, is how we're treating those containers. So we have containers and they have services and this is not a new idea. But we're, what we're trying to do is treat them as functions, the same way that you would treat a closure function. And this has actually helped us to reason not only about the code that we're writing in closure, but also about the services that we're using to build up our system as a whole. Okay, so let's start walking through this. So if you, you can see that the front door of the system is kind of the next step down. What we're going to talk about right now is the data before it gets into the system. We have it coming in from different sources, and we've given users clients where they can put that data into a map, because I love putting data into maps. So how are we going to talk about that data? Confession, super duper love dice. If I can use dice in a slide, I'm very, very happy. So I started putting together slides that were talking about what my data looks like. I had some Eden going. And then it started to get kind of big. So what I wanted to do instead was take a step back and think about data and different types of data represented as dice. So if you'd like a little bit more of a concrete example, one of the data sets that we deal with a lot is seismic data. So you could think about one shape of dice as the, the streaming size uh, waveform data coming in off of a seismometer. That could be one type. Another kind of data might be the seismometer data itself, like where is it located on the Earth? What's the state of health of that, of that instrument? Um, so those are some external types of data. You could think of another type of data as things that we've developed in-house, like 3D Earth models and the like. Okay, so what I'm trying to convey is that we have a lot of different kinds of data that we don't know all of the times right off the bat, and we have to be able to support all of those. So in case you're wondering how we do that, We've decided to go with closure spec to start to talk about our data. Um, we've been thinking about this system. We work on a lot of different projects, so we think about systems for a little while before we start building them. And so we were talking about this, you know, for maybe last year. And I listened to the interview with Rich Hickey on the Cognicast last June. And I was like, okay, that is totally what we're going to do. Spec is solving a lot of problems for us. So the examples that I've highlighted here are a couple of ways that we're using spec. So we have, we need to be able to have common attributes that a lot of data has in common. And this is an example of a latitude attribute um, that anything that has to know that's position on the Earth can use. And below that, I have a station latitude, so for like a seismic station, and it can just use that same spec. So we've got some reuse already built up, but we have some specificity happening as well, which is really nice. I just went to the spec training on Wednesday. I think there's a better way to do this. I'm not looking at Alex. <laughs> so, um, but I kept this in just because I wanted to keep the example. Um, the other thing that we're leveraging, um, let me hold on. Before I go to the next slide, the other thing that I wanted to say was that we have a lot of information about what our data should look like. So we have a data shape, and we know that it's going to have some of these things that we spec out. But the other thing that we have that's kind of odd is that we have some data that's kind of hitched along for the ride as well. So if you have, like, say, seismic data, and it's coming from different places, there are going to be some things in common. It'll have some traits that we've spec'd out. But there's some other data that our users really don't want to lose that we don't need to care about but that we can't drop. So spec lets us talk about data that we do care about in a very specific way but we don't have to check the data that we're not concerned with, and we don't have to lose it. So this has been a really big win for us. So how do we support adding new uh, types of data to the system? For that, we're using the multi-spec feature of spec, um, which is hard to say. <laughs> so multi-specs are kind of like multi-methods in that you can dispatch on a function. And what happens is as data comes into the system, it has to know what shape it is. And then based on that shape, the multi-method can say, OK, you need to be validate, validated against this particular spec, and it can go find it. That's nice. What it lets us do, though, is that we can start adding new shapes to the system without having to change anything. The point of entry to this is this multi-spec. And so if we want to add more specs to the system, we don't have to change anything. And this is, this is pretty cool, because we are, like, requirements kind of just keep flowing in at us. Oh, can you bring in this data? Oh, can you bring in this data? So we need that flexibility had to be built in from the beginning. OK, so we have these clients where people are uh, putting, like, where users are putting their data in maps, and we know that it has to conform to a spec. 
but we need to actually, this is my motion for like wrapping up a present full of data. We're going to have to send it into the system some way and encode it. So for that, we're using transit. And I have a little snippet of, of code here. These are all just like teaser code. They're not <laughs> fully working code, uh, but they're just highlighting the points that I want to make. And so here's just an example of creating a writer and then putting shape data in that writer. And then that will package our data up. But then we have to actually send it into the system. And for that, we're using another library called HTTP Kit. This supports transit and message pack. And it was also fairly straightforward to use. I'm going to pause here because this is kind of how this talk is going to go. We, I have a whole bunch of different needs that, this, that we had to meet. And we really wanted to, uh, to meet those needs using existing libraries and using Clojure so that we didn't have to handwrite all of this stuff ourselves because we needed to get up and running as quickly as possible so we could get researchers using that data so we could find out how they were going to use our system. So we're doing kind of a flyover of a whole bunch of different libraries. I'm just going to talk about how they're supporting what we were trying to do. OK, so we have our data packaged up. It's time to send it in through the front door. This door does not lead to the mines of Moria. And that's what it looks like. It leads into the system. And right now, we have a pretty simple front door. It's just, um, I can show you what it is. It's Composure API. Um, this is something that we've used on a lot of different projects, so it was very natural for us to put it in here. I've heard talks about other things at this conference that I'm going to investigate to see if they might be better fits. But what I wanted to highlight here is that it, we pretty much just have something that's receiving data, checking it, and if that data is valid, sending it to wherever it needs to go in the system. So let's talk about the data validation part. So if users are sending you some map data, and you know that that data has to be validated against a spec, you'd think that you might have to write a bunch of code to have that happen. In reality, we just call specs valid method, and it does all, that checks, all those checks for us which is pretty awesome. Like We didn't have to write any of that validation code. The other cool thing is that if there is a problem, if the data isn't valid, we can call explain data. And it will return a map of the errors that were found in that. And we can go through that map, it's just data, and build up an error string that's useful for the user. We didn't have to write any of that. It was just a huge win right away to be able to just build on that. So if the data is valid, we need to get it into the system. And for that, we're going to use Kafka. So I'm just throwing a little teaser in here about the Kafka components, because they integrate with Composure API. I'm going to continue on. OK. So next in our system is Kafka. Uh, the idea of using Kafka is not like a revolutionary one. I'm sure a lot of people here are using it. The particular reason that we chose it is that, as I mentioned before, we kind of have to give users a hook into our system. So we needed a way that we could have lots of different processes operating on the same data. So picture data coming into the system, and you have a process that wants to grab it and just write it. Don't do anything to it. Just keep it. Then you have another process that's like, mm, I want to do some like quality checking on that data, and I want to save that. Then you have another process that wants to take that data, funnel it somewhere into some sort of processing pipeline. So by using Kafka, we can have lots of things pulling that data off and doing different things on the on operating on it in different ways. It's not like the first process that gets there gets the data and nobody else gets it. So we made the decision to use Kafka. And we were able to just, uh, there are quite a few Kafka libraries. So we picked one. And we were able to just kind of get up and going with Kafka relatively easily. There's a couple Kafka-isms at the beginning of the send, method, of send function. And at the end, we just hand it data as a map. And that's how we get our data routed into the system. Yay, now we get to write some closure code. Uh, so right now, all of the processes that are pulling things off of, our, of Kafka are very creatively named writers, because they're going to write data so that we don't lose it. Uh, in the future, there could be any number of things that are operating on that. We already have a, a researcher asking if they can uh, give us an algorithm that they're developing that can get, like, get at that data as it's coming in and do some processing on it. So these are the writers that we've written, and we are using Component to deal with the statefulness there. It was kind of like one of these moments. I'm like, oh, I have to keep track of state, and I don't feel like that's right. And then I watched Stuart Sierra's talk, and I thought, OK. He's already thought about this. He's already kind of proposed a solution and a design pattern in his Component library. So we adopted that. 
And I just have an example here of like a snippet of part of creating a datomic component. So this component implements the lifecycle protocol, and you have to have a couple of different functions. I'm just showing the start function here. But the cool thing here is that you create your connection and you throw it in a map, and then component knows how to deal with those kinds of things. And so once you have your component, what do you do with it in your system? We throw it into a component map, or a system map of components. This is kind of a boring map. It has one component. But in practice, we have lots of different components. And the cool thing is that your system map can kind of have dependencies set up. So you could stay set up, or you could specify how you want, what order you want those components to be stood up in. So if you have one thing that depends on another, you can specify that as well. And then once those are in the system map, you call start, and component will walk through all of those components and start them up. So it's nice to have this already thought about and already developed that we could just leverage and move forward. So where are these writers writing this data? Uh, right now, we have a couple of different databases. We have some stuff that needs to be written to a file system. We also have requirements coming in for bringing in more databases. So right now, we have one writer per database that handles um, getting things written to persistent storage. And we're currently using Mongo and Datomic. Those are the ones I'm going to talk about here. So we had a customer tell us that we had to use Mongo for the geospatial support that it offers. So that's why we're using it here. And to interact with Mongo, we're using a library named Monger. It makes it very easy to be closure-y with Mongo. I did a lot at the kind of the command line that comes with Mongo, and it was nice to be able to think about my data just as maps, and I could put it in the database that way. So what it took to get us started with that is just creating Mongo collections that look like our shapes that we know about, and then we can just move ahead with calling a pretty straightforward insert function, and, and it goes. There's always logistics behind databases, but we're just going to say everything worked great. <laughs> Datomic is all the rage at this conference, so I'm glad that we are using it as well. Uh, we are not leveraging the full capabilities of Datomic at the moment, but we wanted to pull it into our system right away to start getting familiar with it because there's a case coming down the line that we're going to need to support pretty soon. And that is uh, the a case where as data comes in, it gets manipulated and transformed by different processes along the way. So if you could picture a, data, a piece of data that's moving through a system, an algorithm is making a calculation and changing it, and it's putting it with some other data and changing that, and then you get kind of a result at the end. An analyst that's looking at that result wants to know why that result is what it is. They need to be able to say, what was my data at this point in time? What changed it? Why did it change it? How did it change it? This is pretty important if you're kind of going to make decisions based on that. So it turns out Datomic kind of like already does this for us. So it was a, a cool thing to be able to get this in right away. Using Datomic's pretty easy. Um, once you have your schema set up so that it looks like your, your shapes, uh, you, you can go ahead and just call transact with your connection that you've pulled out of a component, and it will, you can write your shape data that way. Something that's, that I mentioned about spec with the multi-specs is that I can add um, more shape types to the system as needed. But something Elizabeth mentioned yesterday is the fact that you can actually change your schemas as needed. So the cool thing about Datomic is that as we see our data needs change and our data definitions change, we can grow with those changes with Datomic and we can still support everything historically as well that was already in the database. So this is a pretty powerful concept to be able to leverage. So I don't know if you've all noticed, but that once your data is in a database, users usually want it back. They don't want to just know that it's there and safe. So we um, have a GraphQL layer that sits on top of all of these different databases. We've had a lot of systems in the past where researchers would actually just hit the database directly. So if they wanted some data, they'd write a SQL query and they'd get the data out and they'd write scripts around this. And then if you ever needed to change the database, they'd get really upset because it would break all of their scripts because they were hitting it directly. So we wanted a layer of abstraction so that we could make choices related to our databases and what we chose and how we implemented our schemas without affecting how they, without them having to know how to access that database. 
So GraphQL provides a really nice layer for this. Um, it provides a way for users to specify what they want, and then the implementation behind the scenes knows where to go, can take that request and figure out how to fulfill it based on where that data is in our system. So currently we're using GraphQL CLJ. I'm pretty excited about the Lysenia talk I went to earlier. Uh, if we, if we've kind of set ourselves up so that if we find that we need to change technologies, everything's pretty isolated, so it should be okay to do. But here's an example of um, using GraphQL CLJ to parse a query, which is a, a user, how a user would ask for data, and to validate a schema that we've defined. The other thing that's really cool about GraphQL uh, is that you can get, you can stand up a GraphQL endpoint. So we have a lot of cases where users are in different languages and are hitting, needing to get data in different ways. So by having this endpoint, they can hit they can get data if they're using MATLAB, if they're using Python, if they're using uh, Clojure, if they're using Java, and I'm sure there's other things that I'm leaving out. But this is a nice unified way for users to be able to get at data in whatever tool that they want to use. All right, so here's that whole diagram again. Just as kind of a synopsis, you have data shapes, these are our dice that you've defined. Um, and they have used spec to do that. Oh, I have all of this labeled. I'll go ahead and put it up. <laughs> uh, so you package that data up with transit. You send it over using HTTP kit. Composure API is used with combined with spec to validate that data and get it routed into the system. Uh, we have uh, all that data is going into Kafka. We have writers that are pulling that data out of Kafka and writing it to different databases. And then GraphQL is used as uh, an implementation of the GraphQL spec is used to get that data back out. Okay. So, what are our opinions on this approach? I would say it's been a critical success. <laughs> so, for those of you who don't play tabletop role-playing games, a lot of times with the 20-sided dice, it means that you've had a resounding success. Um, so we've been pretty happy with these choices. The choices to use a language like Clojure, the choices to use existing libraries instead of handling our own, have enabled us to get up and running and get this into the hands of the researchers that need to get at the data very quickly. I like to be inclusive, so here's success in a couple of other role-playing games as well. All right, so what are some of the things that we love beyond just having all these great libraries that we can use. One of the things that's nice with using Clojure and using libraries that other people have developed is that you have a generally smaller code base. The project that I'm describing here is not the only thing that our team works on. We actually work on a lot of different things. So we are constantly putting things down and picking them back up and forgetting about them and then coming back. So anything that decreases the amount of cognitive load it takes to kind of get back into a project is a huge win for us because we're doing it all the time. Not only does Clojure have composable parts, but by separating all these the system into all these different containers, we also have some composable parts just in general. And this has also been something that's been highly beneficial. As I mentioned, we have to be able to let um, our users kind of put things into our system. So by giving them those boundaries of how the data is coming in and the data is going out, we can actually support that for them. I didn't really talk about this previously, but being able to have some interop with the JVM is great. We have a lot of Java code, and we're going to have to start making that Java code available in the system as well. So being able to use something like Clojure that has a pretty nice interop system is a huge win as well. Not everything is always super rosy. Um, so I have a daughter who's in track. And she's a thrower. She doesn't have to do the whole hurdle thing. But when I was watching her the other day, I was in waiting for her turn to come up. I was watching girls run hurdles. And it struck me that if I had to do that, there is no way I would get over those hurdles. It would just be like, I wouldn't even try, because it's just immediate falling. But as I watched the girls that were doing it, they were able to clear them because they had training, and they had thoughtfulness, and they had skill, and how they were going to approach this obstacle that was in front of them. So the hurdles that I'm going to present are not immovable obstacles so much as things that we need to figure out how we're going to navigate with care. 
Hurdle number one is most definitely that there is not a lot of closure at Sandia. We are one of the few teams that I know that are using it, and the reason that this is tricky is that it's hard to bring new people onto our team. It's hard to transition things that we've worked on to other teams. So the, part, the way that we're kind of addressing this is that we're starting to kind of share the love. We're starting to have sessions where we talk about closure and what we love about closure and what it's bought us. We have one coming up where we're going to do the same thing for Datomic. And we're hoping that by opening these up to this larger audience, we can start to get some more excitement about how cool closure is, especially for all these problems that are completely focused around data. Uh, the fact that spec is still in an alpha version has definitely caused us uh, some areas where we've stumbled, uh, mostly because there are definitely folks where I work that really want to be using things that are released and solid. I don't see us moving away from spec, so we've got some plans in place for how we're going to mitigate that, but that's something that we've had to think about. <laughs> this feels like an admission of failure to me, but I had a lot of trouble getting, com getting component figured out, not so much as in following the examples, but figuring out how I'm going to use it throughout the whole system and getting everything to integrate well. Um, yeah, I'm just saying that it was hard. So if you had a hard time with it too, then you can feel validated because somebody else did too. Oops. So moving forward, this is a really new project. So these are kind of the diff this, our first take at how we wanted to do this. It'll evolve for sure. One of the things that I've alluded to is that we want to start bringing in a lot more processing. So right now we're bringing in data and we're storing it and that's great and users can get it out and they can do their own processing with it. But we want to bring things in that are going to be um, hammering on the data as it comes through. So that's on the horizon. And the other thing we'd like to do is incorporate some closure script. I've heard a lot of really great talks about closure script here and I think it would integrate pretty seamlessly with the way that our system is currently constructed. So I think that would be a great next step. So did we solve the problem that we set out to solve? I would contend that you don't actually completely solve, wash your hands, walk away from a problem like this. But I do think that we've set ourselves up to grow. We've, set, we've made some decisions that have given us some flexibility to evolve. And I think that we're going to be able to handle the requirements that are coming down the line. And the reason I say this is I don't have those moments where you wake up in the middle of the night and realize, OK, I've made a decision. It's an irreversible decision, and now I'm stuck. And I'm not going to be able to, to change the system in the future. So I think that it was a good, I think all these choices were good. And that's it. I, of course, went through it much faster than I did in practice. So I'm hoping that by the end of this, you do understand where dice and mountains are related to closure. If you have any questions, I'll be around, and please come find me. Thanks.